Chef Rainwater. <laughs> Am I allowed to call you Chef yet, or are they are they Nazis about that at your your new cooking class? I nobody's calling me Chef Rainwater there. I'm just. I mean. Now do you, but do you have to call your instructor chef? Yes, yeah, chef. Like how Gordon Ramsay commands everybody. <laughs> no, not like that. <laughs> okay. It's not as um. No, those classes are not as um. What's the word? As Author- militant. Auth- yeah. Not uh, as yeah. Authent. Auth- what was I going to say? Auth- Authoritarian. <laughs> yes, that's it. Thank you. I can't speak today. Now, which is great time to record a podcast. Um. So if you do not follow Mr. Rainwater on Instagram, I highly advise that because he's got awesome art stuff. But recently he's been posting food stuff now. If you've been listening to us for however long we've been doing this godforsaken podcast, I am Mr. Food, right? Like I am always (laughs) cooking. I'm making food analogies. I'm thinking food, thinking flavor. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, yours, yours is the Instagram that people should check out for food, by the right. way, because you take excellent photographs of the stuff that you make, and like you make some pretty awesome recipes too. And most of them, I just kind of make up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we can get into that a little bit more uh, after I've talked to you about yours. So, the first things first. What inspired you to make uh, to take a cooking class? That's that's really where I want to start oh, with this because. I mean, desperation to get out of the apartment is the main reason okay like like the that idea came about because i was just like i was just like looking at things going on in baton rouge where i live and i was like okay what are things that i could do that i'd actually want to do like i looked at bartending classes for a second Ooh. and that's not out of the question right like mixology sure that's still something i could I could take upon myself um, should I get to that place. But I ended up falling. Um, I don't even remember how I fell upon it, but I just, oh, you know what it was? I had I, one day I had gone to this place called Red Stick Spice Company that's in uh, Baton Rouge. And it's a really nice shop. Like they sell a lot of great spices, a lot of great cooking stuff. And they do a lot of stuff with tea. So like they're kind of, they have an interesting arrangement because they kind of set it up to be like a one-stop shop for like just general cooking kind of needs. Um, and so they have this huge room that's just sectioned off. That's just for like their cooking classes. And it's got like professional kitchen with a giant Island. And there's like four different ovens, four different stations for people to work at. And, um, I was like, oh, you know what? Because I was remembering that. I was like, I should check out and see if they're doing anything. Because I like to cook. I like to learn how to cook. There are things that I don't necessarily know how to cook that well. Like baking is something I'm not that great at. And I'd like to learn more about. So, like, what I ended up doing is I started just signing up for classes. And they're not super cheap. I mean, it's like, they're like 95 bucks a class often. So, like, you... It's like a two-hour, three-hour thing. You cook a meal, and then you eat a meal with the people that you cook with. And a lot of this stuff is kind of – this is the really fun part is, like, they kind of do all the measurements for you. So, like, you don't have to do the measurements so much. You do mostly, like, chopping, a lot of the um, cooking techniques you do yourself, right? Um But you go by a recipe, they tell you the recipe, they show you some techniques that you can use. Like one technique that I've learned multiple times and I still haven't really actually used is how to like properly chop an onion, like kitchen style. Like if you really want to dice it. With your knuckles, right? Right. Well, and the other thing that you're supposed to do is you're supposed to, um, I'm probably going to get this right, but uh, this wrong, but I think you, uh, you keep the bottom like root part. And then you cut, like, you don't cut all the way down. You just cut further, far enough. And what you're doing is you're allowing that root part to keep the whole onion together as you're dicing it so that you're not having Uh, to, like... Oh, so when you turn it on its side, it doesn't fall apart. Yeah, exactly. So it allows you to cut through it much faster, and you can actually get a really fine dice. I have never seen that, so I will definitely be trying that technique the next time I have to chop up an onion, which should be relatively soon, actually. I yeah, I chop up making... onions all the time, and so I've been, I'm used to doing it in the most like fucked up manner possible, right? 
<laughs> well, I know it's going to fall apart towards the end, but I've just gotten myself used to that and accept it, right? Yeah. But, like, there's this technique now where there's – now, there's this technique has been around for centuries, and, like, I just refuse to learn it because <laughs> – whatever you know <laughs> that's but that's still that's good though i mean um so when you say it, it's 90 bucks a class the class is just a one-off it's a one-time show up cook this thing and then you're done yeah it's like different themes for every class and they have a, a ton of classes and so like i i kind of pick basically what i've done is like i can do i can afford to do like one a month so okay. And sometimes if it's like there's really good classes, like I'll do two a month or something like that. So like um, the first class I ever went to was for making gnocchi. And so I was like, oh, pasta. I've never made pasta before, and that would be a great start, right? And so like we ended up making two different kinds of gnocchi. This is potato gnocchi, which is right. kind of more intensive version because you have to like rice a potato. You have to bake potatoes. You got to do all yeah. that. And then there's another kind we made called ricotta gnocchi. Ricotta gnocchi is fucking delicious, and I highly recommend it. And I can send you the recipe this evening. But it's it's just a, a ton of ricotta cheese, flour, eggs, and some herbs. You mix all that together, and then you boil it. And hmm. you don't have to be particularly – like, it's not like other pasta where you have to, like, have a particular kind of form. Like, gnocchi is sort of designed to be, yeah. like – you just kind of throw shit together kind of a thing. Yeah. And you can make really easy, delicious comfort food. So hmm. we had made three different kinds of dishes. The ricotta gnocchi dish was um, a basil cream sauce. So that was like basil pesto, uh, heavy cream, uh, parmesan, reggiano, and then like garlic and shit like that. And you just kind of, you toss the sauce together and you toss it with the pasta. Uh, another one that we made that I was really surprised about with the potato gnocchi, we made a sauce that was, you just, you brown butter and you toss sage in it and that's it. Yep. Toss that with the potato gnocchi. And that was my favorite dish too. Like that was, I was amazed by it. Like all the dishes we made were good. But that one was like incredible how easy it was and how delicious it was. Yeah, that brown butter sage sauce is something else. I've I've made that once or twice already and my my wife is like, "When you making that again?" I'm like, "Do you know how much fucking <laughs> butter is in this? Like it, the calories alone are going to murder us." Like that that one we have to be restrictive on. Tomato sauce and all this other kind of stuff I could kind of get away with, but when we start doing like the olive oil based sauce or like the butter based sauce, like it, yeah. it, it's just too much for calorie wise for me. Um, and I'm not really that big into fats when it comes to sauces. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's a good break from the norm and I love butter. Like who doesn't love butter? But, right. uh, I, it's just not, I know I can't do that that often. And it's oh, one that of those was, things that, that can get addicting real quick. That was definitely the case with the, um, the basil, cream sauce because it's just it's the entire dairy farm you just throw into it <laughs> like everything is just like cheese 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 milk cheese is it's really good though but it's definitely something that so like i've made it for i've made it for my dad and his partner recently and i'm gonna make it again for my cousin and his wife soon because it's it's a dish that's like oh yeah that's please make that kind of a thing <laughs> You know, <laughs> and that become that starts that that'll start becoming like like when there's like get-togethers and stuff like that. They're gonna be like, oh, are you bringing blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah I guess I can't. Like my grandmother, <laughs> there is a a fried chicken that I made once, and it has a um like a brown sugar spice seasoning that you add after it's done. Like immediately when you pull it from the fryer, you dump it in the basket, and then you sprinkle the seasoning on, so that way. The remaining oil that's still kind of there yeah. before it evaporates, it it clings it to the chicken. My grandmother is in love with this chicken. Like every time we're doing a thing, or whatever, and I'm like, well, what can I make? She goes, bring that, bring me my chicken. All right, <laughs> and that that ends up being it. And uh, I've you know I've I've made variety different of it because I used to make it as like tenders, but then I started making it like a popcorn chicken style sure. or whatever, and that seems to go over a lot better with everybody because they can kind of take three or four and it's good enough and then they don't have to get like a ton of it you know what i mean because yeah when you add stuff like that sugar seasoning and stuff after the fact 
a little goes a long way, especially, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Especially because fried chicken, you could sit down and everybody could eat it until they're full. But when you have something like that on, you really want to be, you want to taste it. So you want to add enough of it, but you also don't want to eat enough of it that you get yeah. sicker than sick. So yeah, there's uh, a restaurant, um, there's a restaurant near me called um, City Pork. They do that with, fr- with French fries where mm-hmm. they like. We'll toss it with a little bit of sugar, and that little bit of sugar is just enough where you're like, "Oh shit!" Like, I'm gonna eat this whole thing. I'm not gonna share with y'all. Fuck y'all. It's some. It's something different. And see, that's the thing that I like when I do what I cook. I like taking things that are normal and then just twisting it just a little bit yeah. to add something different that you may not have done before. And like that's nine times out of ten, it's the weirdest thing. And I think I've said this on the podcast before, but. But I taste things in my head before I have made them. You know what I mean? That like that's it, It's kind of like when I see a movie, like an idea for a movie in my head, and yeah. then I go when I write it. Same difference. But it's weird that I can taste something before I make it, and then I'm, like, driven to replicate it in real life. And oddly enough, and I, of course, we, we have to get back to this because we're us and we're season three. <laughs> I immediately go to chat GPT and I start putting in all of these ideas <laughs> and try to tell it, Hey, can you figure out the ratio of how much I should add for this? And da, 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 da. and at least use it as a starting point. Yeah. And it's been a real big help for me because sometimes you think of the, like, I think, or I should speak for myself. I think of weird ass shit that no one else has thought of before. And when I Google it to see if anybody else has to kind of find the jumping off point, nada, there ain't nothing out there. So, the idea that I can use that book that I talked about in the first time we talked about food in a pod, on the podcast, um, the Flavor Bible, I will go to that usually as my first source. Okay. And I will look up all these ideas and see if they meld together and what else can work with them. And then I will go into chat GPT and I'll tell it, you know, I want to create this dish with these ingredients. Can you help me write the recipe or figure out the ratio? And then it goes from there. And then I'll make the recipe once. I'll taste it. And I'll think, okay, this needs more cumin. This needs less red pepper. This needs more cayenne, blah, blah, blah. And I'll tweak it from there. But it's been a lifesaver for me. I'm curious to know. So now that you've you've entered chefdom slightly more than you had before, because you were cooking before this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. uh, I'm just curious to know if you've been dabbling with AI recipes at all. Not yet. I mean, I know I am at some point. Um, I've... With me right now, my thing is getting into arguments with Chat GPT. So like I haven't, I haven't. Have read... you caught it in a lie yet? Because I enjoy doing that. No, I haven't caught it in a lie. Not necessarily a lie, but uh, being false. So like yeah. I, 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 I'll, I will ask it questions that I know the answers to a lot at the time, uh-huh. just to see what it says. And when it gives me the wrong answer, I will, I will Sheldon Cooper. It. I'll be like, actually, blah 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 blah, and it'll be. Like, I'm sorry, you are correct. I blah 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 blah. And that's always fun. But then, like, ten minutes later, you can ask it the same question, and it still gets it fucking wrong. So <laughs> I don't understand what's going on there. But anyway. Um, so No, what... but with recipes, yeah, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't yet messed around with getting ChatGPT to make up recipes. But that is something I want to do for sure. You do know that you can, because you had talked about becoming a bartender. You do know that you can also ask it to become a mixologist. Yeah, I've help seen you... you talk about that too, yeah. I did. I don't know if I mentioned it on the podcast, but I did. I, I definitely think I told you, but I straight up asked it to interview me and then create a cocktail based on me. Yeah. And I, I have not made it yet. I meant to do it while my wife and kid were in Florida and things just got away from me and I just wasn't able to put it together. But it is on my to do list. Uh, it was a very interesting concoction of things. But I, I was I learned how to make simple syrup, which I didn't realize was just sugar and water <laughs> and then just boiled down until it's reduced into it just like a uh like a syrup um and that you can that by putting syrup or putting sugar and water and then mm-hmm. putting whatever flavor you fucking want yeah. in with it and boil it down to the syrup form creates a syrup that you can then use to create other things so like your wildest dreams can come true. Like you can take the flavor profile of, I don't know, fried chicken or or a churro. churro. Yeah, sure. Whatever recipe it is. Fried chicken. 
add it to the fucking add it to the fucking simple syrup and then you yeah. can make like a ice cream that tastes yeah. tastes like fried chicken and it's like yeah. now i know how they make jelly beans like <laughs> right no the, the, you know the the interesting way you know an interesting direction maybe to go with simple syrup might be like doing something with barbecue you know mm. or like pepper jelly something something to that effect yeah you can kind of that with liquor could be fun pepper jelly with liquor could be really fun Liquor is another thing that's fun to add to things now that I've I've been cleared and doing things like I I had never made, um, what the hell is it called? Chicken cacciatore, mm-hmm. until I got cleared and now it's one of my big, like everybody oh, loves it. Oh, because it requires dish. wine to make yeah. it. Yeah. So I wasn't putting it. So like I anything that required stuff. I'm a purist in that way where I like if if I can't eat something or if I really don't like a particular ingredient, I yeah. probably won't make the recipe because I don't like to fiddle with things the way they're supposed to be. Like if, I tell this to my wife every time we make the recipe. The first time I so if it's somebody else's recipe, no matter what it calls for, whatever. The first time I make the recipe, I always make it exactly to recipe. I do not alter a damn thing. I don't add more of this. I don't add this in. I don't take that out. Nothing. We have it the way it's written. And then after that fact, if we decide that we like it, but this could have been better or that could have been less or blah, blah, blah. That's when I'll start tweaking. And then we never have the same thing twice. Like every time we have like uh, my fried chicken recipe, I tweak something. I'm always like, well... What if I add MSG? What if I add, um, there's like this uh, umami powder that we had yeah. gotten, which is basically shiitake mushrooms that are just ground up. Yeah. Um, and I like I'll sprinkle some of that, and I'll just see what it does to affect the flavor profile. And I like just experimenting and doing different things. One of the next things that's on my to do list is, uh, what the hell are they called? Compound butters. So you can do a lot of different things with compound butters. What makes it a compound butter? So a compound butter is basically you take butter, right, and you you don't melt it, but you soften it enough. Okay. And then you add whatever else that you want to add to it, right? All right. Blend it together and then put it in, like, shrink wrap, put it back in your refrigerator for at least an hour, and let it come to like a hard uh, butter again. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if you're familiar with this particular YouTube. Uh, I don't want to call him a chef, but he's uh, he's definitely a cook enthusiast or uh, whatever. His name's Guga, and he's this Brazilian guy. He lives in Florida, and he does these food experiments with steak and beef and all these mm-hmm. kinds of stuff all the time. He did a food experiment where he did a compound butter. And he was cooking it for a steak, right? So you usually when you cook a steak, you cook it. And then when you take it off to rest, you put a thing of butter on it or you baste it in butter as you're cooking it. Like he usually cooks on the grill a lot. So he cooked it on the grill. And then when you set it to rest, he put the compound butters on it to kind of melt on it and rest and get absorbed into it. What he didn't do is tell his other his crew that taste tests what he put in the compound butters. What he ended up doing was he took an entire Big Mac from McDonald's, cut off a piece of it, and blended it into the butter, made the butter. Then he did the same thing with a Burger King Whopper, made the butter. Then he took like a Taco Bell taco, made the butter. Like he took all these like different fast food sandwiches and he made compound butters and he rested all of the steaks with them. Yeah. And and then they ate them and they were so like this is like amazing. So did he like put it in a food processor or something? Yeah. Oh, yep. okay. Okay, okay. And you you, you got to blend it together and then okay. then it then it becomes a cup, but he didn't take anything off. He didn't take off the lettuce. He didn't take off the tomato. <laughs> he didn't do it. like he didn't even take out the beef. Like he took like the beef stayed in it. And he does this every now and then, and he swears by it. Like, whenever you use a compound butter, the steaks go, like, amazing. So, like, that's going to be one of my things going forward is I'm really going to want to play with that because, like I said, he does some weird-ass shit with putting things in compound butter, and I know I can up him, up the ante on the weird. Sure. So, 
<laughs> I'm very, very, and uh, with summer season coming up very soon uh, around here, I'm going to be grilling left and right. So that's that's yeah. going to be my my fun time this summer. And I don't nice. know what I'm going to do with it. I, I obviously think one of them is probably going to be like spaghetti and meatballs or sauce, like it, like <laughs> or pizza or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um... Yeah. Just to see what happens. I'm very curious. Cheetos. <laughs> I think he did that one, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I think he did that. I think he did, like, Cheetos, Doritos, um, Funyuns. And, oh, Funyuns uh, would be really good, actually. And, and Takis. I think he did Takis okay. as well. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like, all those kinds of things are super weird. And that's like right up my alley. Now, I don't know if you could do it. I got to check with the the flavor bible and all that, but part of me is like I wonder what would happen if I made a compound butter with cinnamon toast crunch. And oh, then put awesome. that on a steak, like a cinnamon uh, yeah. steak. That yeah, that maybe. would be in, interesting to try. Like I don't know if it'd be good, but I would definitely give it a whirl. No pun yeah. intended. I I mean it would probably work better for chicken than steak, I would think. Um there's a lot of uses I could think of for that butter beyond meat, but yeah, chicken might be the better match. Well, then that's the other thing that I've been thinking about. So um, there was a one of those TikTokers. I don't know what his name is. The guy that's always like, "Come here, come closer," or whatever, and it zooms in on his thing or whatever. He was talking, and maybe you knew this already, but one of the reasons why McDonald's fries is like unique from other fries. They deep fry them in beef fat, right. which I didn't. I didn't know that. Mm. So I'm very interested. Like I know that there are tons of different oils and everything. You gotta like learn the smoke points and all that jazz. But I'm very curious to start doing different, fr- like fries in different oh, oils to yeah. see what happens. Because that's another thing that I was I taught myself a couple weeks ago was using sous vide, which if anybody who's listening is not familiar with, it's basically. Uh, vacuum sealing a food and then putting it into a controlled temperature water bath for a certain amount of time to uh, either cook to an exact temperature or to meld flavors together. Um, I realized that I could do infused oils by sous vide and not burn the oil. Nice. And so like I could put a bunch of garlic and olive oil and rosemary into a sous vide bag, sous vide it for like an hour or two and have like a really good, I don't want to call it a compound oil, but a, a flavored infused oil yeah. for doing things. So like, I think that would be delicious to make that oil and then make French fries in that oil. Like, you know what I mean? Like that would be yeah, a nice be Italian, a uh, Italian French fries or something. I don't know what, you know, you could always, and there's a million different ways to do it. Like I know people have, I, at one point last year, I think I did truffle oil. Uh, on French fries, and I know that's a thing, but I don't know if you could cook. Have you have you oil? fried with olive oil? Frequently. Okay. All right. Not I've deep heard, fried. I've, I've made okay, like I was you know. Say I've heard a lot. Of, I mean, because apparently olive oil has a very low like burn point. It's no, not... it has a high one. It's like like four hundred degrees. Is that so? I'm gonna. I double guess I check. say this. I say this because I've heard people talk about don't try and deep fry with olive oil deep fry with like canola oil or peanut oil or things like that okay so it is very important to make this distinction and i will tell you this uh even before uh, i finish googling this yeah there are two different kinds of olive oil there is an olive oil that has a low smoke point that you're only supposed to use for like salad dressings and then there's an olive oil that you're only supposed to use for frying which is the extra light olive oil Oh, okay. I mean, I use extra virgin for everything, so that's probably why. Yeah, the extra virgin olive oil has a smoke point of around 410 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty uh, pretty high, actually. So, But yes, there's there are two different olive oils that you're supposed to use. Uh, most people use the green one, and that's the one that you need need to use on salads and dressing like th- that's that's the purpose for that one for pestos and things like that sure. the, the one in the yellow bottle is the one that you want to use for frying that's the the correct one with a better smoke right. temperature and all that kind of stuff uh but i use that one when i'm doing meatballs and chicken parm and all that kind of stuff nice. but i've never thought to um make 
French fries in it. And I think that would be interesting. Like, I don't know if I told you this before, but so they sell, I had seen Google talk about this before. It's beef tallow, right? Which is basically beef fat. Um, and I had ordered it and it was like South side Wagyu, Wagyu, uh, beef tallow. Yeah. And I'd used it before and it came out fucking amazing, but I cooked my popcorn instead of using like the canola oil to f- yeah. to pop the popcorn i used the beef tallow and it was so good <laughs> it was ridiculously good so that's you know what i mean like i think oils and compound butters i think the fats are things that i'm going to be playing with because like we were talking about before that sage butter that brown butter if i could make that using sous vide right At, or and like add another element to it I, it doesn't need it. I think we can both agree with that. But yeah. I I am Dr. Frankenstein. I like to keep going no I, matter. That's, no, the, that's the alchemy that makes cooking fun. I mean, coming up with new ideas and trying new things out. That's all the real fun stuff. I mean, I haven't even I haven't messed around with sous vide yet. That's definitely like next next step for me. I'm I'm not. Um, I'm not super deep into like the um, culinary tech yet, right? Because there are there are levels sure. <laughs> to that onion, so to speak. I would recommend because this is what I do. Because if you do look up the sous vide thing or whatever, it's like two hundred bucks just for the stick, nice. and then you got to pay another fifty for a water tub oh, okay. that's a certain kind of plastic and all this. There are crock pot slow cookers, right? That yeah. do sous vide. And then they also do slow cooking and they also do rice steaming and they also do blah, blah, blah. And they're like 70 bucks. So that's what I use when I do my sous vide is because that way I have all those multiple options in case yeah. I need to cook. So, you know what I mean? Like if I'm braising something or whatever, um, that would be what I would recommend to you and to anybody else who's thinking about it. Get one of those slow cookers. You can look them up on Amazon. Just make sure it has sous vide in it. And then uh, those, it's worked out perfectly fine for me. I haven't had a single problem with it. Um, I'm curious to know though, like, how is your brain going with the 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 class and everything? When you look at when you finish recipes now that you've done several of them, are you thinking to yourself, this T-shirt doesn't know what they're doing? I know better. Are you at that point yet where you're like, because there's an artist in you? And the artist yeah. is going to affect everything that you do. You know what I mean? Your creativity is innate. Like, it's just an artist thing. Right. And not necessarily, like, not every art uh, chef or cook or even people who in, in different mediums have that. You know what I'm saying? Like, some people are just uh, gaffers. Like, they show up and they like the sure. set and that's their art, but they don't really apply artist artistry to other things where I feel like you and I are a little bit more multi uh what's it? multi-medium kind of thing with sure. it sure interdisciplinary so, yeah there we go um <laughs> so I'm curious to know if your artist your inner artist has kind of started to emerge in terms of thinking about oh I could do this better or this could be done like this, like a, a technique that we did a different way and it would work faster or better. The texture would be better. Like, are you thinking about those things? Cause flavor is obviously one thing, right? Like everybody thinks about flavor when they think about food, but the artist starts thinking about the texture, the, uh, the plating, like all of that stuff. Sure. Are they going over that kind of stuff or are you playing with that in your head? Like what's, um, how's that going? <clears throat> They often, I mean, in the classes I've gone to, they've often done the plating stuff. This last class that I went to was the first time that I ever actually did the plating myself for the things that I was cooking. Um, and it was really just because they were kind of busy with other stuff. Like, over time, they've become to recognize that, like, I'm one of the more apt hands in the kitchen and are more willing to be like, hey, do you want to also do this? since we're kind of scrambling to get these other things done, I'm like, sure. Cause for me, it's like, I'm coming to have fun and cook and I'm not there on a date night. I'm there just as a single guy looking for something to do outside of my apartment. So like for me, like it's, it's about like, Oh yeah, let's just get this meal cooked and have fun doing that and learning. Cause like for me, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I, I feel like I'm learning a lot in every class cause I'm doing things I've never done in the kitchen 
I'm stepping outside of comfort zones because, like, my comfort zones have been for the longest time like Cajun cooking. But like in Louisiana, pretty much everybody has some amount of knowledge of how to cook Cajun food because it's just that. Yeah, it's the it's culture. That um, so like outside of that, I've never really stepped that far out in terms of cooking like. Like I said, or like cooking pasta, cooking like I baked a cake for I think really the first time, honestly, ever really baking a cake um, at my last class, and um, you know, using the broiler in ways that I don't usually use the broiler because I don't feel confident with the broiler, you know. Um, like. I keep I will keep going to these classes because I'll keep finding myself learning stuff. And if I don't find my if I find I go to a class and it's kind of like mm, not really, we've done this before, you know, yeah. or I don't feel like there's anything and I'm lear- new I'm learning, then I'll stop going, um, or find higher level classes because those do exist. Like the I think it's called the Louisiana Culinary Institute does classes that are more like intensive um so like i might look into that at some point this is sort of more recreational for me so i think and part of the reason i i kind of chose it too and at such like a low sort of entry level place was that i could kind of turn off my artist mind because like Mm. doing that most of the day so like it's kind of nice to have something where it's like i can turn it off and it's more about doing kind of grunt work type stuff, but learning, right? Yeah. I know I can learn things here that I will apply later on when it's just me in the kitchen coming up with recipes and finding uh, in finding tastes that I hadn't considered before because I now know of some things I hadn't heard about before. Like I learned about agridulce, which is like um, – you like caramelize onions and then cook it with like fennel and dates. I think fennel. I'm gonna have to look at the recipe again, but I think it's fennel and dates, and um, a couple other things. And it's just like this delicious, savory, sweet kind of topping that you can add to whatever you want. You know, huh. like it. So the dish we made, it went on like roasted carrots with like marinated goat cheese, and it was. It was like the best way you could eat carrots. I can't so, think of a. I need to talk to you about this because you made a comment. I think it was on Twitter. You made a comment about this cooking class has changed your entire viewpoint on carrots. Like yeah. there, there's like so many different ways that you can eat a carrot now. And I was curious to know if you could explain that a little bit more. Well, maybe it's just maybe it's changed my entire viewpoint on like. I don't know why I'm saying that too, because there are there are more like insane ways to use a carrot that I I've known about for a really long time. Like I probably talked about this before about making cheese with potatoes and carrots. No. And <laughs> so like when I lived in Portland, like I was I was cooking for a lot of vegans, and so uh, you know you figure out ways to make things that you like but are veganized. So like the thing, one of the thing I'm still most proud about. And when people ask if I'm a good cook, I will say I can cook fucking gluten-free vegan gumbo. So I can do anything. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But with cheese, like you can, so you do like, I think it's a, I can't remember the ratio is one to one carrots to potatoes, or if it's two to one potatoes to carrots, it's something like that. But anyway, the, you get the ratio correctly, but you pair um, potatoes and carrots together, and the starchiness of the potatoes act like the the glue to make it to make to give it that gooey, creamy texture, and the the sweetness and starchiness in the carrots add an additional like glueiness but the sweetness is what you want from the carrots that's the main reason why the carrots are in there and you pair that with nutritional yeast and a couple other ingredients like lemon and some other stuff and it makes a an alarmingly close to cheese like flavor it's about as good as you can get with vegan cheese quite frankly like 
I've had a fair amount of vegan cheese, and they're always trying to improve the technology all the time. But like, that's about as good as you can get with like um, ingredients that you can buy at the store, essentially. But um, but that I'm dish, never going to eat that. But it's yeah, interesting. I mean, <laughs> the vegans in the chat. Um, but uh, but that dish that we made the other night, and I wish I could remember the name of it, the one that was made with the agrodolce, um, that was just like a new way to serve carrots that I had never even thought about because I just don't, I don't eat roasted carrots that often. And when somebody yeah. was like, hey, well, I was thinking about making roasted carrots, and they're like, I'll eat some. I'm not that excited about it. <laughs> but like, you roast carrots that way because I mean, you also had to like. I can't remember how the carrots were marinated, but um, you, the carrots were marinated in a certain way, and then that with the agrodolce, I'm like that's it's such a perfect pairing. It pairs so well with the agrodolce that I just like that's a that is a set dish that I'm making in the future from now on because it's just that good, you know. Fair enough. I see. I'm not that way with carrots. I just I don't know. Carrots have always been a dog thing for us like we buy carrots and we give them to the dog because i think <laughs> i think the only thing we've ever done with them is glaze them with honey and you know and roast them and that that's yeah. been the extent of it um for me it's always broccoli like i i love a good broccoli dish i i i don't know what it is but i'm weird even then because i like stems i'm the only person in the world that eats the fucking stems first I like and broccoli the stems too I mean, I, I'm into, like, stuff like broccoli salad. Like, that uses a lot of stems, too. See, but is it steamed, or are they just raw? It's raw. See, so I can't do that. That's too crunchy for me. People but I probably like... shouldn't do it. It's not that great for your digestive system. <laughs> um, But st- but uh, but broccoli itself is still f- really fucking good for you. Yeah. Um, And that's one of those things that I just never was into until I started cooking, and then I started realizing... There are ways to make things taste better than what they are, especially vegetables. Like, and like my new, uh, they're the the two things that I absolutely never ate before that I eat tons of now are broccoli and uh, sweet red peppers, red bell nice. peppers, yeah. red bell peppers on fucking everything. I could literally, I literally, I've made sauces with red bell pepper peppers. Like that's like the base, yeah. and it's fucking incredible. Uh, I think, I don't know if you saw it, but a couple weeks ago for, uh, I think it was the Super Bowl. Yeah, it was the Super Bowl. I made Philly cheesesteak egg rolls, and then I made the roasted red pepper for the dipping sauce, and it was so much better. Because, like, for the longest time when I had Philly cheesesteaks, I would always put ketchup on it. Yeah. And then I kind of wanted to just do something different, and I had a roasted red pepper sauce because uh, my dad can't have as much salt, sodium, in his diet, mm. and... Instead of, I had looked it up online, and instead of doing like tomato sauce for spaghetti, you could do a roasted red pepper sauce, and I had made it before. Nice. But then I made it for this egg roll thing, and it was out of this fucking world. It was just like, it's literally olive oil, roasted red peppers, a little bit of lemon juice and lemon zest, and I think maybe like like a little bit of like cayenne pepper or something like that. I, I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head, but that's it. And then you, you just puree all it in a food processor. And you can heat it up or you can eat it cold. I always eat it up. I don't I don't like eating cold sauce on stuff, but uh man was it fucking out of this world. Like it was just one of my favorite things. So uh I I kind of I, I said that because I want to rescind what I said previously about not eating the vegan cheese because if it was presented to me, I would definitely give it a shot. Just so I could say I tasted it and, and get an idea of it. When my wife was pregnant with our son. She had a meat aversion. She could not stand huh. beef. And yeah. if any of you know me, this was fucking torture. Um, she couldn't eat beef. She couldn't smell beef. She didn't even want to look at beef. So what I did, being the loving, caring husband that I am, I went out and tried uh, impossible beef or beyond beef or whatever, whatever it fucking is. The worst fucking thing. <laughs> I have ever smelled cooking in my house. And even she was like, yeah, I would have rather you made actually ground, uh, actual ground beef. It would have made me less sick than that. But but we tried it. Like, I, I will try it. There's right now upstairs, and I can't wait. I don't, stop me if I've told you about this, but I bought 
ground kangaroo. Whoa. Yes. I found this in the grocery store. There is a meat section in the grocery store where it had, like, a lot of weird meat. So it had, like, uh, bison, elk, like, all of these, uh, venison, those kinds of things. Which you don't normally find in the grocery stores around here. And I looked over and, you know... I've I've seen ground bison before. I've seen uh, uh, I've heard people talk about elk before. I have never seen anybody yeah, say they've had ground kangaroo. So it's in the freezer. I have no idea what to use it for. I don't know. My wife was like, "You cook that on a day when you're cooking for yourself because I'm not <laughs> eating. I'm not eating that." But I am 100% trying to figure out what I should use it for. Part of me was just like, I should substitute it and make a hamburger helper <laughs> with kangaroo. <laughs> but I don't know if I want to disparage the good name of hamburger it, helper. <laughs> I would assume it would taste pretty gamey and maybe it would. I don't even close, know what that word means. It's like I'm trying to think how to, I hear it quite it. a I've lot. Eaten, I've eaten things that are gamey and I'm like, Oh yeah, this is a little different. Like duck, especially like it's a little more, um, the flavor is less coming from fat and it's coming from like, uh, the protein. it's like a, it's like a slightly more bitter like flavor, you know? Okay. Um, it's not a bad flavor. It's just different from like most of the meat that we eat is like usually super fatty or like, um, even the lean meats that we eat are kind of fatty. So there's always a lot of flavor coming from that and when you're eating gamier stuff it's just there's just not as much fat because like those animals are running on just you know the leanest possible conditions um so usually it just tastes like it's a little like i said it's a little on the more more bitter salty side okay there's no like sweetness or like there's not it's not a savory i think is in, in when a you future, think of savory. Okay. In a future podcast, and when I say future, I mean within like the next two months, mm-hmm. I will have cooked this and I will report back and let you know how, uh, I almost said Rocco tastes, but Rocco was a wallaby, not a kangaroo. So yeah. that would have been a, a, a mistake <laughs> in that. But, but I will cook the kangaroo. I don't know what the dish is going to be, but like, I don't know. If somebody gave you kangaroo, what would you think about cooking? <sighs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. How is it present? Like what? It's part- ground. It's, it's ground, it's, right? Yeah, it's, it's ground. ground. So I don't even tacos. Um... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I haven't even taken the time. I did. I didn't even take the time to look up what it equates to. Does it taste like chicken? Does it taste like pork? Does it taste like beef? Does it taste? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know I've what... Never, I've never eaten rabbit, but I would guess that it probably tastes like rabbit. Probably somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. I mean, kangaroos are essentially giant rabbits. Yeah. So... Just more muscular, basically. Muscular, less fur, yeah. Yeah, that would probably make sense. I've never had rabbit either, but you know something? I want to say rabbit was one of the things in that bin. That yeah. of, of frozen beef or, or frozen meats, I should say. That's interesting, uh, too, because people ate hair for, like, the longest time until just recently when, I don't like, they're just not a big farm animal, I guess, is the main thing, you know? Yeah, and that's, and see, that's one of the things, like, so one of my big things, and I don't know if I talked about this in the past or not, but uh, going into my ancestry, right, I've really been interested in trying to find like so i know what my ancestry is predominantly i'm predominantly scottish so i got for christmas a cookbook which was on my list of scottish recipes like scottish Mm. stuff and a lot of it's fucking haggis and that kind of stuff and i have had that that's a lamb right i have had lamb i'm not a fan of lamb so i don't know how much of this (laughs) But, you know, it literally is like an old Scottish cookbook. And it literally is like 1700s. You're fighting for your life. Break two sticks. Put them in some water. Put the put the the intestines of the lamb in the water. Add some, 
some spices and boil for two hours and there's your dinner. Like it's really disgusting stuff, but I I'm planning on, on trying to get into that a little bit this summer as well. I'm trying to find some things like when I did the, the cocktail that chat GPT or whatever, I had it infused like Scottish ancestry or whatever. And it just basically it just fucking did the garnish was like a Scottish thistle, which was fucking lame, but yeah, Yeah. it's like a weed. Um, but I'm curious to know for you, now that you're kind of doing this cooking class and like you said, you've you've mostly cooked Cajun type cooking. Mm-hmm. Is there a certain like area of what's the right word? Food genre that you're interested? I know you mentioned baking, but I'm talking like Italian, modern American, French cuisine, Asian. Is there sure. a particular way that you see yourself kind of leaning towards or you're you've been thinking about trying to experiment with like what's on your mind in terms of where you want to go personally the thing i want to be i've i've done it before but the thing i want to be like really good at is sushi um like that's the one that i want to like i would like to perfect more and then also learn about like what are like what is even what is even the techniques used to make to prepare fish in a way where you can basically serve it raw? Because like that t- that whole thing to me seems mysterious. I take it on good faith that I can eat this fucking raw salmon at the restaurant and it's not gonna kill me, right? Yeah. They're doing something right, but I don't know what it is. It's there's something going on in the back room where it's like this is totally acceptable if you do it this way. That is um, on my that sushi's not necessarily on the list, but uh, fish is more on my list now that fish because is really hard to, to do well too. I, f- I feel that's see, that's the thing along with getting cleared for drinking alcohol. I also got mm-hmm. cleared for fish because for a long time I thought I was allergic for most fish. So, yeah. uh, that has opened up a world to me. So I think this summer there is no doubt in my mind because I love smoking meats now, like, you know, smoking brisket, smoking pork, Smoked yeah. salmon is 100% on that list. Like, it's I, amazing. I I'm love smoked salmon. Very yeah. much wanting to try that to see what all the the raving is about. I've tried seafood. I have not cooked seafood. So I know I like crab cakes. And yeah. crab cakes is definitely something that I want to try to learn because I very much enjoyed crab cakes. Although, I, I, from what I can see, it's very expensive. Crab is uh, one of those expensive. things. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the times when I, cause I tried to do it before, but when I went to the store, it was all imitation crab. And I don't know what the yeah. fuck that means. It's, uh, it's Pollock. <laughs> it's fish. So they, they take usually, uh, usually it's Pollock that they use for imitation crab. Most of the imitation crab that you or most of the crab that you eat, like on a lot of sushi is imitation crab. Mm. So like, it's just because crab is so expensive that it, rarely is there an opportunity for somebody to actually buy like legit crab is delicious right but like we were saying it's so prohibitively expensive that you're not going to get it that often like it's so good in a gumbo uh it's one of the crab shrimp and crab gumbo is like one of the best things or like in a bisque like um like a corn cheddar crab bisque that's pretty good um yeah, it's I, I love crab, but yeah, like we're saying, it's it's a hard it's hard to get a hold of for sure. Are you in a coastal town? Like I know uh, Louisiana is on the coast, but I don't know if you yourself are on the coast because no, it's I a boot. No, I don't live directly on the coast. It's about fifty miles. So oh, like, okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty much Gulf Coast because like we like where I'm living, either here or in Lake Charles, like the whole line where I'm living is is all Gulf Coast. So like we get. We get first dibs on a lot of the seafood. Okay. From the, from the See, gulf. I'm like 50 feet from water. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so even we, more so. <laughs> yeah, so like that, we have a lot of seafood shops that uh, that are along the water that will sell a lot of stuff. So like, I'm very much going to be. I think lobster is also on the list. I you know I I yeah. think I've had lobster. I don't know if I cared for it. Um, I it was one of those things that was that I if I remember correctly. It was just overhyped for me. Everybody's like, oh, sure. you got to have lobster. You got to have lobster. You got to have lobster. Then I had lobster, and I was like, well, I don't know what the fucking big deal I is here. I can make a recommendation. Lobster sure. mac and cheese. Okay. That's good. Well, That's I do good. make a pretty banging mac and cheese these days. And 
So this will this kind of ties into what I was talking about before. I realize you're taking the cooking class to get out of the house, yeah. but I can tell I can't tell you literally everything I've ever learned about cooking. I've pretty much learned from YouTube. Sure. And that's that has been my teacher since this entire thing. So the the whole thing started when I wanted to lose weight, and I was losing, uh, I, and I was just cooking for myself. I told my wife, "You're on your own. Do whatever you want, and I gotta." focus on just the, the foods that I'm eating and when I can eat it and how much yeah. I'm eating and whatever. And after a while, burgers got old. <laughs> and I still <laughs> love me a good burger, but I still needed something different. I needed variety. Yeah. And part of that self-reliance of I'm responsible for myself, I had to teach myself how to cook things. So I went to YouTube and I started learning how to cook everything. And then I started buying cookbooks on my Kindle and I would go from there and then I would start mixing and matching like i would pick up a technique from a cookbook and then i would see something else in uh, a youtube video and i would kind of put the two and two to together to yeah. kind of do it so like for the longest time i was making the driest fucking mac and cheese mm -hmm. it was i was either putting in cornstarch or flour to make the roux uh yeah yeah not doing that anymore yeah now i'm just uh i'm actually boiling the macaroni in evaporated milk hmm. and then I add the cheese with a little bit of cornstarch salt and butter and that's it and it makes gooey flavorful mac and cheese and that nice. has been my my saving grace so that's the other thing is like I love taking different cheeses like there's a bunch of different cheese shops around here so like nice. I'll go and I'll be like I've never heard of this fucking cheese but I'm trying it, <laughs> um, and I will try and di do stuff in different mac and cheeses. Now when you say to do a lobster mac and cheese, what type of cheese are mm. you talking? Yeah, are you well, talking cheddar? Well or are you lobster. talking? I feel like it's got to be a white cheddar or like yeah, a white cheese, right? You can't. Yeah, you can't go with a. You need something more mellow. Like you can't go with like a sharp cheddar. You need yeah. like a probably white cheddar or. Um, yeah, I would say like a white cheddar, personally. And That's probably the kind that the I butter, I assume, like... right? Because isn't that one of the big things about lobster is butter? butter. Yeah. yeah. So absolutely. So I mean, it is butter. lighter on the cheese, but it pair like lobster for whatever reason pairs really well with it when you do that. Huh. Well, protein's protein. I'm not gonna turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to eat more protein is the the biggest uh, challenge of my current life. Lobster's a weird one too, because I'm only a. It's like kind of it's hard. lean, right? Yeah, it it is. It's like it's like eating. I. It's somewhere between like shrimp. And the other one that I'm going to – I'll say it's somewhere between shrimp and crab because I was going to say crawfish, but I don't think – I don't think you have – you have uh, – you've eaten crawfish. I don't crawfish, think so. Yeah. So that's probably not in your, in your mental palate. Um, it's a little similar to crawfish, but it's it's got like a shrimpy kind of like flavor to it. Like, But it's more salty. Like it's got that kind of – I don't know. Like have you had oysters before? Maybe I don't recall. Okay. Yeah, if you don't recall, oyster, you probably haven't eaten oysters in because oysters have like they it's taste like, like jelly, right? They it taste was... like the ocean. Like it's just salty, kind of like like you know you're eating something that has sucked up <laughs> all of the pollution in the water <laughs> that's been sitting around in. It's not Fair the enough. greatest flavor I, ever. Um, I don't really get why people eat raw oysters now. Broiled oysters, that's different. But that's because broiled oysters, you basically are dousing in butter and garlic and Parmesan cheese. So at that Ooh. point, it's not even, you know, acknowledgeable as like seafood. <laughs> that's more my language, though. All right. Well, that's been interesting. All right. So is there anything else that you might want to throw out about food that you have learned? Anything that took you by surprise, maybe, or anything coming up that you're looking forward to? Don't, um, don't skip out on like an easy, uh, what do they call it? The, those fucking box cakes. You can make a, <laughs> you can, you can do some pretty good stuff with those box cakes. If you mix it up with like some jello pudding powder and stuff, like Ooh. 
It's surprisingly effective. So long as you I'm, have your ratios correct. Like I'm that way with banana bread. Like that is a that is a fucking Achilles heel for me. I uh, anything banana really. Yeah. Uh, you know, well bake wise. Like banana well, I don't know if it that's not baking, but banana pudding, banana yeah. bread, banana whatever. Like I that is a fucking Achilles heel for me. I can do that and the box ones are just amazing i don't know yeah. why probably not real bananas you know uh, the i'll also banana... say like as as fancy as it sounds ganache is like the chocolate ganache is like the easiest thing in the world to make hmm. as long as you use chocolate bars so like don't use like chocolate chips don't use like hershey kisses because those are i think i think it's shellac that's the main ingredient in those that help them keep their form yeah and that shellac fucks up the process if you're trying to make ganache so if you use chocolate bar it doesn't have shellac in it so it doesn't get weird when you're making it hmm. i mean ganache is just like um simmer heavy cream pour it into a bowl of broken up chocolate from a bar yeah. and then just whisk it until it's you know thoroughly yeah. mixed together and it's delicious and you put it on top of a cake <laughs> Chef Rainwater, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that's that's my uh, that's my like catchphrase. You just put it on top of the cake. Put it on top of the cake. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> All right. Well, we will uh, return to this subject at some point in the future, near future, uh, and I will have an update on my kangaroo dish. And I don't know yeah, what so it'll curious. be, but we I will definitely report back about it. And I then I want to hear more about. Uh, the cooking class, and if there's anything else that you've picked up on. You sent me a whole bunch of recipes the other night, and to be honest with you, I did not That's... look at them yet. I I glanced at them, but I haven't really, like, sat down and, like, said, that one I'm going to make, this one I'm going to yeah. make. I've just been a world – I've been a mess. If anybody know me in my personal life right now, you guys know that uh, I'm weathering several storms at once. So life has been a little bit uh, of a whirlwind, crazy, crazy time. But – I will say this, and maybe you will echo this sentiment. Cooking, while laborious, tedious, focus-heavy, can be very relaxing. It's oh, yeah. really weird. Like, I know you said you, you did it to, like, not be an artist, but to some extent, I mean, yeah, the artist thing still kicks in, but it is very relaxing. It's just, you know what I mean? It's just a very simple process of do this then do that then do this then do that then do this then do that and sometimes that monotony that routine of following a recipe or doing something like that i know a lot of people hate the word routine or you know like it's just like that's a four-letter word to them to someone like me and possibly to you because we're artists and art is chaos frequently k it's yeah. just here's another problem solve it bitch like that's yeah. that is art that is the life of an artist to just get a bunch of directions and just do it paint by number if you will is such a welcoming thing oh, yeah. so maybe it's just us because we live in that chaos world nine you know 90 or 90 percent of our day um but i i don't know cooking to me has always been like a leisure activity it and that's one of the reasons why too. that's one of the reasons why I won't let my wife ever do it <laughs> <laughs> unless I'm unless I'm like knee deep in a project or something. Yeah. Uh, you know, she can make tacos and maybe chicken noodle soup, but that's the extent of her cooking. Um, yeah, I always like to do it because that's an, it's a nice way for me to break apart from my work day is to oh, just yeah. go upstairs, get all the ingredients turn on some music, some, you know, jazz music or whatever I'm in the mood for. Usually the music coincides with what dish I'm cooking. Okay. So if I'm frying chicken, there's country music going. Nice. If I'm making hamburgers, it's like 1950s Elvis Presley type <laughs> shit. Like it's a Johnny Rockets in my kitchen. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know. I, like it's just one of those things where I enjoy cooking. It's a nice relaxing activity, but uh, I do enjoy the artistry about it. And I'm disappointed that you're not there yet because that's really what I want. Not I really want to be able to talk the art of it for you. Not in these classes. Uh, all the artistry happens in my own kitchen where I'm like ready to fuck something up and like <laughs> see if it works or not, you know? Like yeah. I did that with cookies last week 
where I got really close to making some good oatmeal cookies and I've been trying to work on a recipe, but then like I winged, I got, there was a stage where I winged it and I shouldn't have winged it. <laughs> like I just should have just never uh, with baking. No, yeah, exactly. Which is what something that I'm learning. But, um, I had like the flavor profile was going to be really good, but then I was like, Oh, this dough seems too wet. So I'm going to add some more flour and that diluted it. Like I was just like, Oh fuck. Like it just made the texture weird. You know, I've good, good thing about that is that it's still totally, it's an edible fuck up, but it's definitely a fuck up. Yeah. I've been there with pasta when you're like, Oh, the pasta dough, the dough's not kind of coming together yet. Oh, I'm going to add just a tablespoon of water when you should have added just a teaspoon, mm. there ain't no going back. That's the thing that I've learned with baking is that you can always add more. You can never take it out after the fact yeah. because if you add a tablespoon of water and you're like, shit, I should have done less water, then you're like, okay, well, let me just add a little bit more flour to even that out, and then that doesn't fucking work. And then by the next thing you know, you've got a giant fucking beach ball of useless yeah. dough that you can't <laughs> use for anything. And it's just like a total waste. So... If anybody here is listening and trying to get a, uh, get a hold on baking, me and Rainwater will come back with all of our lessons that we've learned from that because yeah. <laughs> baking, you are not a good cook until you can bake. And I, I'll yeah. tell you this, I cannot bake yet. I am still yeah. very much, because I want to be that motherfucker that makes a cake and then does the artistry, like the very fancy sure. decorations and shit like that. Yeah. But I, I got to get the cake part down first. And it's, it's a fucking challenge. Part. It's hard. Yeah, it's super hard. Um, have you ever watched um, Great British Baking Cook-Off? I'm aware of it. I feel like I've watched like one or two episodes, okay. but I'm not like a... Yeah, that's one that I've, I've found that show interesting because they go into great detail talking about making the sponge, which is like the cake part of the cake. Right, yeah. And that, to me, is like, that's the part that is like engineering because mm. you have to, you're figuring out how you want to accomplish a certain texture along with the flavor, right? Yep. And how to accomplish a certain um, consistency. So, like, that's – once you, if you can get to that point where you understand exactly what you need to do, you are, like, at master – that's, like, master chef level because you understand very intuitively the concept of, like, basically alchemy where you're just, like, I know how to make raw form – you know, out of these simple ingredients. See, the the challenge for me, though, has always been because, like, I, I come from the New Haven area. So pizza is, like, mm. what we're fucking known for around here. So if you can't make good pizza from and you live around here, you can't call yourself a cook or a chef or anything of the sort. And one of the things that I have very much learned is that a lot of a big part of it is about, like, hydration. Mm. And so, like, when you let the dough rise for like making a pizza dough or something, the the humidity factor and the temperature in which you let it do it, it, like do you put it in the oven? Do you cover it with a wet cloth? Do you cover it with nothing? Do you put it with saran wrap? Do you, you know, if it's a hot summer day, what do you do? Like how do you like figure all that stuff? Like that stuff sabotages me all the time because that means you could follow a recipe for a cake in July and make it and have it turn out fine or have it turn out terrible and do the same exact thing in December and it be the complete inverse. And you wouldn't have changed a single ingredient or a single step in the process. Yeah. But the temperature and the humidity and the air and the elevation as to where you are, all that shit affects baking. It doesn't so yeah. much affect cooking, but it affects baking. And that to me is just a fuck. Like it's a fucking arrow to the knee. I cannot once I've, I, I once I've fucked it up. And that's the thing, too, with baking. Baking is frustrating because you do this work and then you follow, like I said, you follow all the steps and stuff like that, and it still doesn't come out. You just fuck this. Ugh! Like that's <laughs> my. I, I have gotten very good at containing my inner Hulk these days, but baking is when he fucking comes out. I just can't. Just imagine the Hulk in a baking apron. That's me when I'm trying to make a cake <laughs> or cookies. But I, I digress. All right, uh, I think we've gone the hour, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in for our second food podcast. I don't remember what we talked about in our first one, but I do feel like I was supposed to come up with a recipe for something, and I didn't. Oh, probably. 
It was like <laughs> sweet potato fries or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Ah, damn it. Well, all right. When we do our next cooking podcast, not only will I talk about my kangaroo, I'll talk about. I'll go out. I'll go back and listen to our first cooking podcast, and I will come back with our, uh, with my answer to whatever it was we were trying to fucking do, um, but a create a recipe type thing or something like that. But I do challenge you, Mister Rainwater, to play around with the Chat GPT and maybe yeah. see if you can come up with a recipe or a drink. Maybe I would be happy to put together and and do a drink or something like that. <laughs> or we could both. Uh, cheers each other with the the Jow and rainwater beverages or something like that. Uh, I think that might be fun. But uh, for now, we will sign off. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in for another week of Midnight at the Spaghetti Factory. Uh, I have been Mr. Jow. This has been Mr. Rainwater. We will see you guys next time. Peace. Later, y'all.